Dan Perkins Media presents a unique and exciting program. Truth Starts Now, a conversation with Dan Perkins. The left has taken away your rights to freedom of speech. Truth Starts Now is a platform for you to regain your voice. America and Americans will be better off if we can have civil and respectful conversations about the day's important issues. Now, here's your host, Dan Perkins. Welcome back. And joining us today is John O'Connor. He's been on the show probably more than any other single person in the almost three-year history of this show. And for a reason. He's smart. He's an attorney. He gives us honest opinions. And um, he'll allow me to practice law without being an attorney. So, John, welcome. Thank you. Good to be with you, Dan. Yeah. So let's, we're not going to talk about the law and the first question I want to ask you. I've, and I, as ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand that I talked to John just before we went on the air. And I said, I don't think in our three year history we've ever had any discussion about this question, but I need to ask it. And he said, I think you're right. So the question, John, what is it like living in San Francisco today? Well, it's a tiny bit better today than it was, say, two years ago, a year ago, where random car break ins were everywhere. People would walk down the street with sledgehammers and in broad daylight in a nice part of town and just smash open windows in cars to see what's in there. Uh, but there are still rashes of burglaries, rashes of robberies. Uh, many retail stores have gone out of business. So there's sort of a doom loop going on in San Francisco. Uh, downtown is still like a ghost town. There are parts of town that are pretty nice. But downtown San Francisco is is a, in a doom loop. All the little uh, bodegas and little cafes have closed. Even pretty substantial retail outlets are not there. There's just not the energy anymore. Rents are plummeting. And what's going to happen is it's not a wonderful place downtown as it is. But what's going to happen is because both tourist dollars and business taxes are going to dry up, and the taxes with hotels and tourist activities. Uh, the city just won't be able to support itself as it had been. There are a lot of people that have good pensions out of San Francisco. There are a lot of uh, services provided. Then you combine that with the homeless situation, which is still very bad. They won't build enough shelters. You can't get homeless people off the streets. So I say it's an intractable problem when you really get down to it. So John is joining us today on The Truth Starts Now. And, and John... What is the physical environment? We we've heard about the needles and the and the feces and the urine. Is that still a problem? It is I'll say it's more localized than it had been. It's a little bit more confined to certain areas. Like I say, one of the big issues is is just the lack of energy and the lack of uh, mobility. Uh, you know, having a number of homeless people around uh, uh, because so many of them are on drugs and are violent. It, it can be scary for people. There's one theater that I like to go to that has very good, you know, it's a, a you know, it's a stage theater. Uh, and, and I like to go in for the matinees, but even coming in in the afternoon on a Sunday afternoon, you feel like you're, you're in danger because you've got to walk through all the homeless people. If you had to guess, and I'm not saying you're an expert at guessing, but I'm, I am somebody, you're somebody who lives in San Francisco. Before Gavin Newsom cleaned up the city so that the the premier of China could come in and not see all the stuff, has it started to go back to the way it was before he came in? It improved? No, it really it, it improved slightly. I mean, I think our mayor, who has doesn't have great constitutional power the way San Francisco's governed, her heart's in the right place. We have a new district attorney. Her heart's in the right place. I like her. And so there's a little more improvement. There's a little more criminal prosecutions. But Remember, an awful lot of retail establishments have closed. There's one very successful mall downtown called the Westfield Mall that had high-end shops, many floors. It was a tower type of mall. That's closing. Uh, there's nothing there. Uh, so that's that's a problem. That's a problem. The downtown is getting hollowed out. The vacancy rate for commercial real estate is 34%. And that oh. understates it because there are plenty of buildings where people are in involuntarily uh, having long leases with a big company. So they've got to be there. 
Um, workers uh, often are working from home. That's another problem with post-COVID issues. So I see a great city really going downhill, and uh, I think it's going down slower than it was at one point. I don't blame it on Newsom. Don't blame it on Newsom at all. And actually, when he was around, the city was okay. I don't think he had anything to do with that either. But <laughs> but it, it's really local politics and the will of people to keep a clean and safe city. And we lost that. And I, I'm afraid it may be irreparable. The two other issues uh, around that, you mentioned some of the stores closing. Some of the major franchises, some of the big hotel chains, department stores are closing. And you've got this huge vacancy rate. Yet, am, am I correct that residential rental rates are going still going higher? They're still healthy. They say they're still pretty healthy, and the home prices are starting to go back up again. I think they dipped a bit, but the home prices are still high. And, of course, you've got high interest rates, which makes it much harder to buy a home. I'm not so sure. So, And because people like their old rates, their old rates they're not selling, Mm -hmm. So there's not a lively market out there as it is. It, and so there are parts of the town that I would say are, are quite livable. You know, the center of the town and the tourist attractions still have some issues. Uh, tourism is coming back somewhat, but it's not like it was before. Businesses, I think, are, uh, I think there's going to be an issue there. Now, what we have is a situation where you said it isn't the fault of the mayor. It isn't, you didn't place any fault of what happened to the city uh, in Gavin Newsom. But if we look at all of the homeless people situation, how much of them are illegal aliens? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know if I can answer that. I would say that that's not a big issue in the homelessness. I mean, there's another, there are other issues with illegal aliens, uh, like such as crime. In other parts of Northern California, there are some really serious Mexican gangs. But I think the Homeless issue is mainly one of drugs and mental health. It's one that society has to grapple with. We don't know how to deal with this. It, here's, here's the doom loop in San Francisco. Because we have not built enough shelters, and the homeless advocates, I think, are do not want enough shelters to be built. If there are enough shelters, the federal courts will allow the San Francisco authorities to rouse these people from their tent cities. If there are not enough homeless beds, which there are not now, the courts have said you cannot rouse them. Well, now these people are camping. When they camp, they inevitably get drugs. To get drugs at a certain point, you need to rob. And there are fences right there that order uh, items to be stolen. So, uh, you know, if, if it's two in the morning and you need a fix, you're going to go to a garage and try to find a bicycle. It's very hard to keep a bicycle in San Francisco anywhere unless you keep it in your bedroom. Never heard that. That's the first time. The treasurer for the state of California two weeks ago said that the budget in the state of California for the current fiscal year will be $68 billion short, a deficit of $68 billion. And he's implied that it could possibly go a little higher as they finish up their numbers. Where do you, where does Newsom get the $68 billion? No, That's part of the doom loop. You know, you can raise tax rates, but tax rates do not necessarily mean you're raising tax revenue because everybody that's wealthy moves out of state. And each time you raise the rates, another group of wealthy individuals either moves out of state or takes or, or spends the money to make sure the income is not taxable within California. So it really stifles. I think we're in a position where there has to be some revenue. Where are we gonna get it? And again, I think that's a doom loop as well. Right now, the uh, state tax income tax is 13.3%, which was only raised, quote, temporarily from 9.7% years ago. And of course, it's never was never gonna go back down. Everybody knew that. But an awful lot of people moved out of state for that. Think about it. If you're a high earner, if you're making a couple million dollars a year, is it worth it now to save $260,000 and move to a new no-income tax state? People will say, well, that's no-brainer. I'll visit San Francisco and Northern California or Southern California when I want to. It's a beautiful place. I'll make sure I'm not there any more than five months a year, and I'll make sure all my income comes in envelopes that are addressed out of state. 
I'll move out of state. And if you're wealthy, you can do that. And an awful lot of people do that. They There's an awful lot of people with businesses in Reno and Las Vegas, for example, that still want to keep contact with the state. This is not new in America. It didn't just start with the Ronald Reagan's Laffer curve, where Arthur Laffer convinced them that there's a point at which when you raise rates, you lower your income. This happened during Calvin Coolidge's reign. And Calvin Coolidge reduced income taxes, and I think they were at 73% at some point, brought them down to 28% at the highest income tax level. And guess what? Revenue increased. People don't buy tax-free municipals, uh, and they don't shelter their income in other ways. So that's one of the problems with the whole progressive vision for society is it's everybody likes, loves sustainability if you're a progressive. Oh, sustainable this, sustainable that. But what about having a sustainable financial model? We don't have one. And so we try to do too much, and it ends up uh, being very, very destructive. That, that's an uh, amazing observation for for me to hear you say that, because I believe that California in the last census lost 750,000, 753,000 residents, which is the equivalent of one seat in the House. So they're going to be underrepresented in the probably in the in the next Congress because of the census. Do you see that slowing at all as far as people moving out? Oh, it's not slowing. And what we're doing, and, and that even that's a little deceptive because that's a net migration of seven fifty three thousand, but we have an in migration. So what we're having is, I'll just make it up. Let's say you have five hundred thousand in migrating. Those are often illegal immigrants or people that are at the lower end of the economic totem pole who aren't phased by high taxes. And the people moving out are from either from the striving middle class who can't afford a home to the millionaires and billionaires who, who don't want to pay taxes. And so we're having people who can pay taxes move out. So, you know, I've just read, and I, I guess I shouldn't try to quote, but I mean, we're losing billions, multiple billions into the many billions every year in income tax revenues by the people that are moving out. Well, John, uh, we're uh, out of time for this segment on uh, Two Starts Now. We'll be right back with John O'Connor and talk about another subject uh, after these commercial breaks. I'm Dan Perkins, the author of a new historical romance novel called Sad Eyes. It is a story of a young woman, a beautiful Irish lass with red hair, green eyes, and curves that won't quit. She is born in 1912 in Waterloo, Iowa. She decides she wants to be an ER nurse, but she wants to move away from Waterloo to the excitement of the big city. She is accepted at St. James School of Nursing in Chicago and began a life as a true American patriot, serving her country in two wars. She fell in love with the love of her life. She takes the longest honeymoon in history. This novel is full of twists and turns and is difficult to put down. You can find Sad Eyes at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and J. Carroll Publishing dot com or through your local bookstore get it read it tell people about it and write a review on amazon this is dan perkins welcome back to the truth starts now with our guest john o'connor an attorney from san francisco and uh, if you missed the first part of the interview go back to the web and, and get it because we talked about what it's like living in san francisco uh, i want to turn my my uh, questioning in this second segment john in practicing law. We've got a situation in New York that there's an indictment against Donald Trump. We have a judge. These are my words, John. You can change them whatever you want. We have a trial judge who's decided that he's a real estate appraiser. And he decided that the value of the Mar-a-Lago estate was $18 million when it's worth many, many, many times that. And yet I find it difficult that the judge would opine on the value of real estate in anybody's hands, whether it's Donald Trump or not. He's not qualified. He doesn't have a license, but he's sticking to it. The other part is, and this is the part that still doesn't make any sense to me, Attorney General for the state of New York seems to think that even though the banks and the insurance companies are fiduciaries and therefore required to do their own assessment as to the value of the properties, as security for loans or premiums. He doesn't seem to care that none of them are 
filed any complaints. None of them have lost a penny. They got everything they wanted. In fact, the banks wanted to loan Mr. Trump more money. And yet they want to fine him $250 million and take his businesses away for the activity that he wasn't responsible for. What's going on there? Let me give you a few legal deficiencies that are glaring, Dan. Number one, the statute calls for fraudulent transactions. It's a consumer fraud situation that normally deals with the little guy who's preyed upon by, say, a predatory lender or a salesperson or someone's going to send them to Las Vegas and doesn't give them what they're supposed to give them. You know, um, uh, they're supposed to give them. And, uh, and it's not meant for big businesses who can take care of themselves. Uh, you don't get a jury trial on this. This is really for low low rent scams, I would say, that bedevil a consumer who doesn't have the income. But anyway, to, to, to go chase this in court. Now, uh, fraudulent means something other than false. You can have a false statement all day. That doesn't mean it's fraudulent. Fraud, you have to get some money from someone in reliance upon a false statement, and the statement has to cause you damage. If you give a false statement to someone and there's no damage as a result of it, there's no fraud. And so the $250 million, well, so first of all, what Trump did was not fraudulent, even if his statements are arguably false about his net worth. it's That's not fraudulent because the banks didn't rely on that. They relied on their appraisers. Right. Uh, it's asset-based lending. They care about the value of the tower, not whether Don, Donald Trump. The only reason they care about his income at all is in the event that he's going to go bankrupt and quits managing the property and quits putting money in, then they might want to call the loan. But basically, uh, they they care about the asset. That's number one. Number two, he's assessing damages based upon testimony from Letitia James Expert that these banks would have charged higher rates to Donald Trump than he paid if they had known about this falsity. Number one, that's speculative. Number two, under the law, that's not damage. In fraud, you have to have out-of-pocket damage. You can't say, I'm damaged because of, if this hadn't happened, I would have taken the money that I spent for this, and I would have invested it in Berkshire Hathaway stock. No, that's not damage. You have to say, I really lost money because of this. If you give me a false statement about a car and I pay $7,000 for it, and the car is only worth $500 because it's got a crack to block, okay, I've lost $6,500. But but if I you give me a false statement about the car and I ended up being able to sell it to someone for $7,000, I haven't lost any money, even though you may have defrauded me into that. So that's, that's damage. It's out-of-pocket damage. There's no out-of-pocket damage here. There's no bank that says I lost money on this. So there's no damage, but yet their expert says there's $250 million. The judge is stupid enough that he's going to award that. I hate to say stupid because it's something a first-year law student should know about the out-of-pocket damage rule. So there's no out-of-pocket damages. Those That money is supposed to be collected by the attorney general on behalf of the victims that were defrauded, and she's supposed to distribute it. Now, there won't be anybody to distribute this to because nobody's claiming they lost anything. Uh, so think about someone they're borrowing. These lenders were borrowing their money at 1% during the good days and lending it out at 3%. So you have a $300 million loan over 10 years. Uh, the bank's going to collect $90 million uh, from Trump and pay $30 million for the money they lent him. It's a pretty good deal. Plus, mm -hmm. they charge fees and appraisal fees and transaction fees. So that's pure profit, that $60 million. And those are the people that are defrauded here. But the other thing they're doing is the statute allows an injunction. And that's the normal remedy. Uh, if someone's doing something illegal, you just simply issue an order. You can't do this anymore. Pay Letitia James costs to bring this to court, and we're done. Now, in an extreme case, you can order a dissolution of the business or yanking of the business license in New York. 
And that's what he's going to do. So he's going to make essentially make Trump sell very valuable building, very valuable real estate. But of course, Trump's going to have to sell it at fire sale prices because everybody knows he's under compulsion. And that's the, by definition, not a free market if if the seller is under unusual compulsion to sell. So they're not going to get the full price. They're going to pay $250 million. It's not damages. Uh, the whole thing is a joke. The judge wanted to start dissolving the corporation before the end of the case. And the appellate court at least said, hey, <laughs> wait till the end of the case first. Then there's an appeal process. And I suspect that the appellate court will stay in a dissolution of the company pending appeal. But, um, it, and this is a draconian remedy. It's one thing to say, let's even assume he committed fraud. Uh, why does that justify putting him out of business? Uh, he hasn't committed fraud, but let's assume he did. Um, if he's doing something wrong, just do an injunction. Say, from now on, uh, give a better a balance sheet to to your lenders. Uh, so this this is so defective in so many legal ways that it just uh, beggars belief here, Dan. Uh, and it's just very ignorant. And what bothers me further is I see all these lawyers coming on CNN and uh, CBS and places like that, ABC, the Sunday morning talk shows. And they don't talk about these things that are very obvious. Uh, there's no fraud as it's defined under the law. And there are no damages as defined under the law. Uh, and, of course, it's an extreme remedy to then dissolve the, the company. So it's just it's head shaking to any lawyer that this would happen. So, John, what 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 I need to point out is it. This is my impression. My impression could be wrong. But when you said that the appellate court said, don't start dissolving the corporations until the end of the trial, why don't we have a case of prejudice on the part of the judge? And the trial should be either a mis mistrial should, could be declared or dismissed. Well, just because a judge is making an error doesn't mean that he's necessarily recused or taken off the case. If I were the appellate court, with all that's going on, I would probably do something extraordinary and, and switch switch up the court. The problem is the court's into it so long, it's the same judge has been hearing this for months. Uh, it's not an economical way to handle this uh, fully. They'll let the judge just rule. And hopefully they will stay any effect of the ruling on appeal and then and then vacate the ruling. I don't know that that's going to happen. If these people are Trump haters on the Court of Appeal, they may let the ruling stand and say, OK, sell the business. And oh, by the way, Mr. Trump, you do have to pay two hundred fifty million dollars. Does he have, um, a, does he have a, a, a further right of appeal out of the appellate court? Yeah, he can go up to the Supreme Court. The appellate court is the intermediate court. So he can go to the New York Supreme Court. Uh, there may be, and I underline may, uh, be a federal issue in a sense. Uh, there's a doctrine that Ruth Gader Ginsburg uh, firmed up before she died about the Eighth Amendment uh, given to the states through the Fourteenth Amendment uh, prohibiting excessive fines and penalties. Uh, in a case in Indiana, a fellow was convicted of a drug offense uh, where the maximum fine for doing it was uh, $10,000. He had bought a vehicle that he used in the drug offense, but w which was not paid for by drug money. His vehicle cost $42,000. The state of Indiana tried to seize it. And the court said, no, that's an excessive fine or penalty under the circumstances. It's not proportional to the wrong done. So what I would say here is, and nobody's really addressed this that I've seen, but if he is fined $250 million where there is no damage, it's, it's, I, I suppose they're going to claim it's damages and not a fine. So let's put that away. It's not damages. Let's say the fine here, the penalty or the fine is the dissolution of the businesses. I think the dissolution of the businesses would be an excessive fine or penalty under the Constitution. So that would allow the reason I bring that up is because that now makes it a federal matter. 
And it could be that the Supreme Court under Timms v. Indiana and that doctrine would take the case. That's the federal issue that I glean out of this. That's a long way away of saying maybe the Supreme Court itself can intervene here. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible miscarriage of justice to take somebody's business away for a bloated, let's say it's a bloated, bloviated real estate developer's vision of what he's really worth, that he's really only worth $3 billion, not $8 billion. Okay, <laughs> so uh, does that justify taking away his business? And I would say, no, it doesn't, and it's unconstitutional. So let's see how this plays out. But it's a terrible thing. I mean, uh, no matter what you think of Donald Trump, you may be a person sitting in your living room saying, oh, boy, I don't like the guy. He's a, he's a bloviating guy. He's vulgar. He's this. He's that. He's the other. But no one deserves this. The worst person in our country doesn't deserve this. Okay, we got a little bit of time left. Let's go to the 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 next log, legal issue, uh, and that is the end around going directly to the Supreme Court to discuss the issue of executive privilege. And this would be in the D.C. cases, I suspect. Right. And um, uh, does does that end around? create a problem for the prosecutor if the if the Supreme Court says no go back down to the lower court is the lower court going to be somewhat pissed off as they went around them and uh and now they've got to they've got to deal with uh, the fact that the Supreme Court said no we're not taking this right now got to go through the process well I think the court is going to take it because they did order briefing on it so they'll probably make a decision. And that's what Smith wanted to avoid. He wanted to avoid delay because if this thing stays at the Court of Appeals, he may have to vacate his March trial date. And that's what he's worried about. Um, but I do think that um, uh, it is high risk for Smith. But if he loses here, he's lost the case and so be it. Uh, I think he wants to get rid of this issue, obviously. I do John, think Trump me, does have a f First Amendment right here as well. Let me disqualify if he loses his appeal to the Supreme Court, the case is done? Yeah, because I think all the actions will fall within presidential immunity, uh, and that's the issue. Uh, now, the court could waffle a bit and say, it sure looks like presidential immu immunity, but that's a matter for the, for the judge below to decide, and we'll give you some standards uh, I suppose they could split the baby here and say, well, to the extent he's doing something purely electorally as a candidate, he doesn't have presidential immunity. But to the extent he's doing something that is within his presidential powers, he's immune there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the problem with that is everything the president does has political ramifications. <clears throat> right. So. You could say that everything he's doing, especially in a case like this that involves elections, still involves his powers as as a president, even if he, if he's politically trying to stay in office. It's still a presidential action. So uh, they could split the baby here is what I'm saying. But there is a chance if there is presidential immunity that the case goes away and Smith is toast. Is there any precedent that you are aware of, John, where a a president, after he has finished his term, has been in, indicted for activities he performed while he was president? No, I don't think there is any. Um, and that was a question that came up with Nixon. And uh, as John Dean said the other day, and one of the times I agree with him, uh, the, the Supreme Court seemed to leave that open in the tapes case that Nixon could be indicted afterwards and i think that's one of the reasons ford pardoned him was because he was afraid he could be indicted for a crime committed while in office that is one again that is gonna could be one of these five four decisions um thomas jefferson in the louisiana purchase felt that he was acting illegally and unconstitutionally by going along with the louisiana purchase but he thought the country should do it and he felt the only remedy against him was impeachment. That's the way these things work, that he couldn't be charged with the crime. You either impeach me or you don't. 
Um, and there's a, you know, some thought that what you're doing in office, that you either impeach the guy, that that's the remedy, but you don't charge him with the crime. Uh, and there's a good sound reason for that, because we don't want to be a banana republic that say, OK, you know, what Joe Biden did in his last term, I think, is criminal. So I'm going to prosecute him. I'm his opposing party. It's not a good thing. Uh, so that question, though, is wide, wide open. It's anybody's guess as to whether he can be indicted for something that occurs while he's in office, even assuming there's presidential immunity. Uh, well, I, I take that back. If he's truly immune, if he's truly immune, you're not going to be able to uh, indict him. But the question is, is he is he going to be completely immune? Um and so, like I say, the, the, you can have this sort of half and half situation. If it goes to the court, what's your gut tell you how the court's going to rule? Ooh, hmm. uh, I, I think uh, that they. <laughs> I'm afraid <laughs> they may say. I'm afraid they may say. Uh, that he's not immune from prosecution for what he does as a candidate, uh, that why should you distinguish between if, if Biden were doing the same thing and he wasn't president? Uh, there's, a, there's a good argument there that this really isn't a presidential act. Uh, it's an act of a candidate. Uh, now, uh, now, what I come to, though, is you've got a First Amendment issue. That, to me, is one that applies either to Biden or Trump. If you're running for office, you think you've lost a crooked election, even if you're wrong, you have a right to petition your government for redress of grievances. You have a right to speak up. You have a right, even not being a candidate, to say incendiary things from uh, the pulpit, so to speak. And there have been some cases in which radical leftists have made all kinds of fiery remarks about destroying the country that have been held to be protected by the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. So I would say that if there's anything here that will really give Trump protection, I think the First Amendment argument is even stronger than presidential immunity. Mm. Well, John, we're, we're out of time. It's always a pleasure to have you on. And uh, what's going on with your books? Mesa, Mesa, uh, people who pick it up love it because it really... <laughs> says a lot about the most important political scandal in our history, a journalistically impelled one, and it turns out that journalism is false. I think a lot of eyes are opened. Uh, needless to say, the Post doesn't like the fact that that book is in existence. Yeah. We've been speaking to our good friend, uh, John O'Connor, and uh, on uh, The Truth Starts Now. John, have a wonderful holiday season, and thanks for joining us. Talking to you, Dan. And we'll be right back. I'm Dan Perkins, the author of a new historical romance novel called Sad Eyes. It is a story of a young woman, a beautiful Irish lass with red hair, green eyes, and curves that won't quit. She is born in 1912 in Waterloo, Iowa. She decides she wants to be an ER nurse, but she wants to move away from Waterloo to the excitement of the big city. She is accepted at St. James School of Nursing in Chicago and began a life as a true American patriot, serving her country in two wars. She fell in love with the love of her life. She takes the longest honeymoon in history. This novel is full of twists and turns and is difficult to put down. You can find Sad Eyes at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and J. Carroll Publishing dot com or through your local bookstore get it read it tell people about it and write a review on amazon this is dan perkins thank you for joining us today and we'd like to hear your comments or questions so go to bwradionetwork.com that's bwradionetwork.com and give us your questions or comments and thanks for joining us today